Aziz and I are here to talk about mapping future cities into augmented reality uh, and the data and design that went into that. Uh, so my name is Tice. Uh, I've had a product at a startup called in situ. Talk about who we are in just a second here. And you see Schneider, I'm head of design and AR at Incision. So just a little uh, agenda of what we're going to cover today. Talk a little bit about who we are as a startup. Um, what's the sort of problem that we identified and why we're even talking to you all today. Uh, why we think augmented reality is useful for addressing that. And so the assumptions that we had going into that, how we validated uh, those assumptions, uh, and then some of the pilots, first clients that we had and continue to expand on this idea. Uh, and then how we expanded that across uh, all of New York City uh, with open data, augmented reality, get into a little bit of the uh, planning development data that we use challenges around that, but opportunities for improving as well. Uh, talk a little bit about how we are structuring your data and what we're actually doing with and data from New York. Uh, and then get spend some time talking about our design considerations around 3D modeling, augmented reality, uh, and then finally talk about the sort of impact that this can have. Uh, we'll focus on what we're doing here in New York. Uh, talk a little bit about how we see the future of augmented reality within city planning. Uh, and then I want a little request for your guys to help and continue to expand the use of open data if you're so inclined. Um, so as promised, who we are, uh, we're a startup based here in New York, uh, and our mission is to bring future cities to life with augmented reality to foster collaboration around the process of urban change. Uh, and our name uh, is based on the Latin phrase in situ, uh, which means in its natural place. And that's how we think uh, development and changing cities should be experienced in their natural place. Uh, and so the problem that uh, we're trying to address is that in general, the processes that go into city planning uh, are outdated. That, you know, there's all these incredible tools out there that uh, city planning, that both here in New York and around uh, the country and the world are starting to release. Um, so you've probably heard about a bunch of them, both in previous sessions and in upcoming sessions, and they're all amazing. Uh, but there's still not enough to make it for just everyday individuals to really see how their community is changing. People don't have easy access to intuitively experience what their future communities will look like. Uh, and when they you know, go to say a planning hearing or they try to look through documentation. Uh, there's often a lot of jargon. Uh, the planning meetings are at a set scheduled time and they can be hard to get to. They're very long uh, and they're just generally can be a, a barrier for people to get involved in how their communities are changing. Uh, and another theme uh, that again, found, I'm sure other sessions, I know other sessions are talking about today is that just because the data is out there doesn't mean that is really usable. That uh, so, you know, if you see some of the examples here, like the open data portal, you know, for a lot of people in this room, this is probably like great. I love this data set. Like I know exactly what to do with that. But like ninety nine percent of people are not going to know what to do with this type of their data. Um, and example like the zoning application portal again, like huge step in making this sort of data accessible. But there's still a little bit of a learning curve in understanding what to do with it. Um, so we want to make sure that the, the data itself gets put together in structures and channels that, uh, anyone, anywhere can understand quickly and easily. Uh, and so what we do is we take all these various disparate data sets and cities, um, we join them together and we create these elegant, informative, uh, ready to AR, a 3d model layers. Uh, so that people can see their future streetscapes, skylines, just how their communities are changing around them. Uh, and I'll pass over to Z. So I've, I've been talking about augmented reality and probably some people are like, I think I know what that is, but maybe you don't. Or you're like, I don't know exactly what that means. So these can tell you all that. And so I'll let just scale it at least like. So augmented reality enhances our view of the environment around us. It's the technology that superimposes 
digital layer on top of the user's view of the real world. Um, the example here uses headsets just to explain like the, the difference between virtual reality that completely closes your field of view and surrounds you with a virtual environment versus augmented rea reality verse that where you're seeing the world uh, and getting a, a digital layer overlaid. Um, but we're not using headsets. Uh, so the augmented reality content that we create is made for everybody's uh, cell phones. Like your most of your devices here are going to be able to support uh, our augmented reality. Well, like I think all of your devices here probably are going to be able to support uh, our augmented reality content. Um, and that is the main reason why we opt for this type of immersive technology. Uh, Immersive technologies have the abilities to create simulations that um, really enable people to better understand and get, for example, a sense of scale, like to, to see something on site and to really understand the scale. That's not something you can get from looking at a drawing necessarily. Um, and so it uh, uses your senses. It's a very um, intuitive way to understand information. And uh, like I said, accessible on your phone. Um, and it gives people a sense of uh, agency and empowers them that they can experience and get this information at their own time and their own hands on their smartphone um, and be able to interact with it. And we really get uh, amazing responses from people kind of interacting with, uh, with AR. Um, we've done pilots uh, in cities across the US over the past two years. Um, Pilots of uh, varying size, location, different types of development. This is a, a photo from a, a pedestrian bridge in uh, Buffalo, New York. Um, a bridge that connects uh, between uh, uh, a neighborhood and, and a park. Um, and it's also a residency project. Um, and we observed with every project, we tested new features, new uh, AR uh, features and experiences and saw how members of the community interacted with AR and we iterated based on their feedback. Um, some of the things that uh, we tested over time that uh, were related, related to kind of things that people wanted to see that were important uh, in shadows. So um, there's, uh, when we tell people about what we're doing, like a lot of the one thing that uh, people care about a lot is the impact of this future development on the shadow that it's going to cast on the surroundings. Uh, there was a case of uh, uh, development in Brooklyn that uh, got rejected, I believe, because of the shadow that would uh, go on the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens. So, um, but to be able to calculate exactly in that time of day and that location, what the shadow is going to be, what it's going to look like is not, um, it's not uh, very easy or it, it's something that takes a lot of development. So that's something that we've uh, experimented with uh, a lot. Um, and uh, another thing, and then this is, okay. Um, this was after kind of taking people on a tour of future developments. We understood that there's things that we are talking about on the tour that um, people find really interesting data about the land use or, um, development um, scenarios. There's like two different scenarios in this case, for example, and to be able to toggle between those two um, and essentially interactive visualizations that allow the user to take themselves through different scenarios related to the development. So that's something that we did and, and um, also got a positive feedback from people because people definitely want to get that information or I think it's easier to get in context uh, overlaid in AR. Um, this feature is a before and after slider just to be able to kind of toggle or slide between the present and the future uh, to get a sense of, of what this looks like with and without the, the development. Um, okay. um, occlusion, this is another, another uh, thing that's um, it seems, uh, it might seem um, like it, it, it's it's not a technical, uh, it's not easy technically to have the existing structures occlude the AR. Um, so that's something that, and it's really important for a lot of different cases. For example, like if there's a building in front of the building that you're proposing for the existing building to hide 
the, the digital uh, representation of the proposed building is um, is something that we're working on. And in this example, this is 4.5 um, to 7 in Brooklyn, but it's a, it's an addition on top of an existing building. So that also has to include inclu occlusion to really represent what it's going to look like. Um, we have done uh, projects that are more kind of custom design interactions. Um, this one is a future wildlife crossing in California. Um, and uh, here you can also see uh, animation of the construction process over time um, and kind of which bars I to do build first. And I mean, we worked with the architects of this uh, development to kind of sh highlight features that they wanted to, to show. Um, this is also from the same project. Um, this wildlife crossing is in an area where there's not uh, for traffic at all. Um, it's a highway um, and uh, we provide an off-site tabletop view for most people that are not going to be able to make it on site. So uh, one of the things that we believe in is is meeting people where they are, and it's and uh and that's why our content is not only available on site. It's only it's also available off site and tabletop um, here. So our learnings from these uh, experiments, um, first of all, like I said, interaction empowers the users, um, and it make also makes them a lot more comfortable with change. Uh, we like to say that we turn uh, NIMBYs into UBs because um, uh, when people really kind of see a scenario that they might fear because it's a very tall building um, in an area that is changing, but seeing it on site to scale often kind of uh, makes people more comfortable with certain changes. Um, the other uh, learning that we have is, is uh, we, like I said, like meeting uh, users on their trusted platforms. This is from uh, a project that we did uh, as a part of our SNAP partnership with SNAP. Um, we had our AR content available on SNAP map and just people found it organically. Um, and this got a really uh, uh, large number of views. It was like viewed more than 10,000, uh, uh, 100,000 times. Uh, which we like to think of as the most visible planning proposal in history, because uh, like it, it just planning proposals don't get viewed uh, that much ever uh, by that many people. Um, and so this really informed our approach that we're not a city planning app. Um, nobody or not many people want to download a city planning app. Uh, we are creating a layer and then goes into where, whatever platform people are already on. Um, and so we'll talk about kind of the, the structure of our, um, pipeline and, and what we're building, um, and easy access. So, um, like I said, people don't want to download an app. Uh, we want to get people into the AR easy. We have, uh, we're creating signage that was on site mm -hmm. and that signage leads you to, um, an app clip, for example. So there's all these technicalities, right? Like to create geo anchored augmented reality, you have to use the phone's native capabilities for that to happen. That's capabilities that only native apps provide, but uh, we're using app clips, which is giving you just a taste of an app without having to download. So just you scan the app clip code and you get the geo anchor they are without having to download. Um, and we have another option that's a web-based uh, app. And, there's, you know, uh, a trade-off there because the AR is not geo-anchored, but you can see it from anywhere. So uh, easy access is is crucial to us. And so we have, uh, like I said, browser-based solutions. We have the webman that we'll talk about in more detail. Uh, we also use social media integration that we create um, Instagram filters and Snapchat filters uh, to meet people on the platforms that they're already on. Um, hang signage on site. Another thing we'll uh, elaborate on uh, in more detail. And um, we have a mobile app. Tice, you want to take a friend? Yeah. Yeah, so what we found uh, with all this is that, um, you know, we, we think we're on this really important time where uh, immersive technologies are just starting to gain traction outside of gaming environments, people are really starting to not just sort of prototype experiences for 
non-gaming a- applications, but actually creating real experiences and products around that. Uh, and we think because of that, there's this opportunity to rethink uh, what planning and development data should look like now uh, and how it can be used uh, to really expand beyond just, you know, we get we get really excited when we're, when we're mapping uh, some of these projects uh, and going from like tabular data uh, where, you know, it, again, for 99% of people, totally unintelligible uh, to mapping, like everyone can understand a map. Uh, we think of like these immersive experiences as sort of the next iteration uh, where it's still geo-anchor and it's still part of a spatial context, but now it's spatial and experiential. Um, so, okay, we, we did all these like individual projects so we were like, well, okay, how do we do this to the cost an entire city? Um, all construction projects are going to have a 3D model. Some engineer developer has, has got that. Um, but that 3D model is not a required, required to be submitted to a city as part of the process. So, uh, you know, most of the time with developer, uh, for their representatives are submitting, uh, you know, drawn documentation, uh, in order to get these permits to build. Uh, so, you know, we're thinking to ourselves, well, should we sort of rely on the developers and their representatives to send us their 3D model? Then we make that, you know, this really seamless experience so that they can send us easily. And, you know, we, in working with developers, we realized, okay, like that's not going to be viable to get the full citywide coverage. Um, so then we started to explore, how can we generate 3D models across the entire city from open data? Uh, you know, these aren't going to be the exact look of the building because we don't have the actual beauty model, but, uh, from open data, we can get enough information to create, uh, a really good estimation of what's going to be built. So that's what we're good. Uh, and in that process, we sort of determine the necessary data attributes in, in order to do that. So things like building height, number of stories, uh, the building classification. So, uh, if that's available, when the, the data is clean, uh, to say, okay, this is going to be this kind of apartment building or this kind of office building. Uh, and if that building classification uh, is not available or uh, is corrupted in some way, like a bad data entry, we can fall back to something like the land use to, again, kind of get an approximation of the building type. Uh, and did that as we, you know, experimented, like, hey, what do we actually need here to, to build these models? Uh, we created, in our mind, kind of what we had is like this sort of like standard data specification for the future built environment. Um, a lot of that, I'll, I'll stop here to say it, like a lot of the open data sources that we're using, their, their purpose is not to show the future environment. Their purpose is to do all sorts of other things. So, uh, how many people were in the housing database presentation right before this? Yeah. So the, the first of that is to show housing unit, which is really, really important. Like that needs to happen, but the, the purpose of it is not to like actually show what those buildings are going to look like. Um, and it's a similar story for lots of other data sets that contain pieces of the information about the future built environment, but, but they're not designed to show it. Um, so what we're doing is, is finding those attributes. And then, uh, right now we're in the process of generalizing that into, uh, an open data specification that that anyone anywhere can adopt to show future uh, building the project 3D. So we're in, in doing that. Uh, uh, we're kind of basing it on this idea of maybe people are familiar with uh, the GTFS data specification for transit data. Uh, so the idea is like Google back in the day, for those that don't know, was like, hey, do you want your transit information on Google Maps? Your data has to be structured just like this. Uh, so transit agencies and all across uh, well, pretty much across the entire world, change their data structure to to conform to that. Uh, we're not Google or how like telling say like you have to do this to use this, but we want to make that available uh, for folks that that do want to use it. So more carrot, less less stick there. Um, and we're using existing data association word as uh, so there is a now dormant project called the Building and Land Use Data Association DOLTS. Um, so a bunch of like 
big players got together and were like, hey, I know we like create a data specification for permanent data. Um, kind of died out, but we're kind of incorporating that into this new standard we're building. Uh, and then using other things around like 3D um, specifications that already exist, like uh, one that we're uh, just starting to get into called City GML. If you want to look that up later, uh, that again, I've already made some attempts at how do we standardize the necessary data components for, for showing these models. Um, so here in New York, that uh, because this is where we're based, we're using, and this is the data sets that we know the best, uh, even though we've learned a ton about these data sets doing this. Um, this is where we're like, sorry to first build out this citywide layer. Um, so we're taking data sources, restructuring them to create for, for us anyway, in terms of future built environment, the sort of like system of record of what's changing across this day, like the actual digital structures. Uh, and that then can easily be used uh, in any digital platform, um, our own or, or anyone else's um, to, to plug into. Uh, and then once we have that layer, um, we have the ability to supplement those estimated buildings with uh, records, plans, designs from developers and, and the representatives. So uh, we've got this full estimated layer and then individual projects, uh, the goal is like, well, I, I really want to show that project. Or if, if it's a city sponsored project and they say, uh, you know, we want to show this uh, to the public in the actual form, now we can easily supplement that with the real 3D model. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Z to talk about some more design stuff. So um, when we're building that layer, there's the question of like, how do we, um, how do we represent this um, data? And um, what, what do these buildings look like? Um, and we've iterated and considered like many different options. Like, do we just create like blocks of color or like the, um, right was the data? Do we, um, make them super realistic and, and use, um, materials that look like real bricks? Because we have the ability to, to do that. We have the ability to show buildings that look really realistic, um, can, and reflective and, and everything. Um, but uh but in this case we're creating an estimation we're creating an estimation of like this is what a mixed use residential and commercial ground floor building looks like in new york in terms of like the the window layout and the 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 height and everything um and and that's what we're going with. so so these are estimations and that's why they're all uh gray they look pretty like standard 3d um and um and on top of that we are providing um and this is work of progress that we're providing more information about like what is this mean in terms of housing unit affordability jobs created etc um and this estimation could be replaced as we mentioned by like developers and architects that want to provide like a more accurate representation but in terms of scale this is what it's going to be like the the height will be the height and uh we the the use of the building the reflects uh the, the use that will be the the final one of of the structure um just to go back a bit like when we talk about 3d models like what and we talk about a already and and 3d models uh that are used for construction um we're getting to like computation and uh real-time computing when we the one show you the 3D model on your phone, there there's the issue of like uh processing power of the computer on your phone. Um and so to to show something like uh, a structure that goes into instruction and development takes a lot of computing power because it has a lot of shapes, a lot of polygons, and a lot of the times that includes information that the person on the street doesn't need to see. Like we get uh models from architects that have toilets that have outlets. Um, we all need that information. And so when we talk about ARNE, we're talking about low poly count, something that your phone can load really, really quickly. And uh, the generated models are that they have like mass, that they represent the mass of the building. Uh, and just the, sh the shell, the things that you need to see to understand what, what this is going to be. 
Um, and another thing I'll mention is that we're also working on kind of like the processing of, of these BIM models and how to make them AR ready in an easy way. So we can actually take one of the, uh, take those and, and more, um, in a more automated fashion, get them into AR. Um, back to you, Okay, Kalki, from Germany. Yeah, hand the Uh, okay. So we've covered, uh, uh, a lot of all right, but to kind of give a sort of, uh, system architecture, very high level share of what we're doing. Uh, we got sort of two primary data sources, neither open data from cities, uh, that we transform into, um, our data standard that goes into our backend. Um, uh, or we have the 3D models themselves from developers. Um, we store the project attributes about, um, the, the project. So not, not just like the building information itself, but any other interesting data that we've tied to that. Um, and the elements that we use for, for generating the building, the height story, uh, those get fed into, uh, this 3D generation, uh, module that we have though, we'll talk about it here and I think the back slider very soon. Uh, and once those models are generated, uh, then we can send those to our AR, um, uh, platform for that's geo anchored. Um, and that both the tidal data or three models or the AR, all three of those can be sent to native apps, uh, web apps. They can be the on-site QR code scan, uh, web maps, and then APIs to go into any and all the existing digital products. Uh, yeah. So can pipe once more to the first is Mike. Um, so we have a programmatic rule-based generation of these three models, um, and we use, uh, data to inform the, the shape and, uh, material also, um, of, of the building generally kind of categorizing, um, okay, this is not really a glass building, right? Like the, it's super tall. This is going to be a glass building. Um, and, um, these models can be updated as frequently as the open data is updated. And I think we're kind of like, uh, working on getting those kind of updates, um, more frequently, but, um, essentially the models are not final. They can be updated and create, uh, we get our versions over time and go back in time to see like, okay, this proposal changed. Uh, maybe there were rejections or, uh, uh and they were reflected on the beta model and, um, Project attributes um, and and data additional data is associated with the three D model, so you can click on the three D model and receive um, additional data. Um, so right now we have um, and this is kind of like something we're finalizing and working on these days, and really really excited is like twenty thousand plus, like more than twenty thousand real and proposed, uh, proposed and planned buildings, um, in New York city that are made available in AR. Um, and, uh, we, should we look at the map then perhaps, or like, uh, um, we, we started sort of, you know, we, we have this layer, um, and we, um, started thinking like, okay, this exists and people just don't know about it like how do we get people to to view this future layer uh and so we started basically flooding the city with qr codes and app clip codes and signage on sites um and we started by doing this to 20 projects that we selected in um different boroughs and just went on site and put signage uh one of them is actually nearby here and i think we can look at the map perhaps uh so yeah, maybe we can. Sure. So just a view of our uh, web map. This is one that's really near. It's uh, 2748 Jackson Avenue. This is the future uh, tallest building in Queens. Um, and you can scan to see this on your phone in our web app. Um, and you'll get the, um, a 3d model that you can look at, um, again, like our estimation, um, and 
you can see it in AR, but <laughs> I promised it. Um, no, it's good. Um, and so um, we really want to enable this exploration also offsite, like you said, in situ, but we want people to see this in the comfort of their own home as well. Um, and um, so the AR is available wherever you are. It's it's going to be out of context, why does that be like um, or, uh, the way you would see it on site, but it's still something that you can look at and explore. Um, yeah, and wait, I just want to go back to the, this. Um, we've we've flooded city with QR codes. Uh, we've been getting a lot of data about how people are using it, a lot of time spent in AR, a lot of just like organic exploration of this content, which is super exciting. Um, we're going to talk a little more about kind of how you can get involved, but I'll give it to Tice to talk about the future of um, AR funding that will be funding. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, just kind of wrap up of like, okay, where could this maybe someday hit? Uh, we're we're done the idea for right now, but uh, some of the scheming and dreaming that we've been doing, uh, 3D model submissions as a requirement for getting a permit. Uh, this could be a really useful way to get these actual 3D models available for people to experience uh, as part of the planning proposal. Uh, and this is actually already happening on a voluntary basis. Uh, countries like Estonia, uh, Finland, uh, Singapore already have this uh, up and running where you can voluntarily submit uh, your 3D model as a developer. Uh, in pretty much all those cases, the purpose of that is actually not for, for sort of AR or public engagement, but it's to validate the permit uh, or validate the submission or a permit. So instead of uh, someone reviewing you know, paper documentation and drawings uh, to, to issue a permit, uh, they've developed some systems where they can take that 3D model, run validation checks on it to make sure that it conforms to whatever is supposed to be built or uh, to the wide to be built. Um, and that's really, really hard. Um, there's still a lot of like active development around that, but we're not, we're not working on that. That's but, but it is adjacent uh, to our work because uh, if that's solved, then uh, we could see a lot more 3D model submissions uh, being available to cities. I found. And even independent of that sort of permit validation aspect, uh, 3D models submissions could still be uh, either required or voluntary part uh, of this process for the purpose of, of AR and public engagement. Uh, so it doesn't have to be that the permit validation gets solved uh, in order for 3D model submissions to happen. Uh, and then another thing we think about is like, okay, we're we're playing QR codes. Uh, we're gonna offer for for other people to do that in a second. But uh, what if that's just like a normal part of the process? So, okay, when you have to post a notice at construction site, um, it's got like estimated completion date, who the owner is. What if that had to have a QR code for the AR? Something. Uh, we've got a radar and um, we'll continue to explore the cities as we go forward. Uh, okay, what's your back to Steve? Yeah. So, um, uh, like I said, there's we have these like 20 something thousand um, projects. Um, and then we've started getting actually requests from people. They're like, oh, there's this development near me that I really want to see it. The AR and I want to hang signage and kind of let me be a part of it. And so we decided to start a community uh, to help uh, reveal what's next for NYC's built environment uh, and bring flying power to the leading world we're on finale. And so uh, Nick here is uh, helping us uh, set up this community. And as a start, and this is basically we're launching it here, um, we have created two uh, channels. One is the uh, WhatsApp. Um, and once a Discord, so whichever people are more comfortable with. Um, and uh, we have QRs here to, to scan to join. We also have postcards if you want to take. And the idea here is that people can request a building, uh, basically request uh, an activation kit. You, If you see a change in the city that you make people should know about, you could just submit a request. And it's a to me, we could we'll call it request. Um, and we'll mail you an activation kit with um, a sign. This is kind of 
what our signs look like, um, and a floor decal. Um, and so you can become a uh, part of making open data usable and accessible to all. Um, we have, uh, for example, one of the decals here is for 2748 um, Jackson Avenue. So you can even walk there if you want to, to put that up. Um, yeah, so that's for the community. I hope you join and, and um, engage with us at HF. Um, cool. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, we're happy to take as many questions as we can fit in. Uh, so I'm going to be your hand here and an hand here. Uh, thank you. Be eager and thank you, Nick, for encouraging your champ. It's this fantastic congratulations of what you're doing. But a few quick questions. Well, first of all, I think I've seen some of the posters. Uh, is there one in Park Slope that uh, yeah. House yeah. ever have you ever saw this six part of that you guys? Yeah. Uh, the question was, again, for the Zoom recording, uh, uh, it saw some side edge, Park Slope was that us. It, it was us. Okay, great. Um, do you have an API? Uh, it is not available yet. Uh, it's still, still a little bit. Okay. Is Denmark one of the countries that is, is um, encouraging or requiring um, um, yeah. QR code submissions? Uh, I didn't see that in, in my research, but uh, a lot of the Nordic countries are are doing that, so could be. I've seen the Netherlands has, has done them based model submissions for permits. Okay, great. Then final point, uh, talk to you offline about this. We can really help you get this on digital signage so that the, the signage part of your Trapped looks brilliant and is uh, exposed and exhibited uh, on the location instance. Are you little asking? Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess you've just, you, you're just rolling it out now. So you haven't had people actually put up signs in their own communities yet, have you? Um, uh, so far only, uh, yeah, so just don't be the question. We're just rolling it out. And uh, if we've had people putting up the signage in their community, uh, so far just two uh, people that reached out to us and we decided that based on that, we actually decided, okay, we need a community to allow people to request that. So yeah, this is the first time we're kind of opening it to a bar public. I, I was wondering if they would get taken down or like how the developer would feel about, I don't know. It just seems like I, I'm wondering, I'm wondering with it. Yeah. So yeah. based on our experience, you know, we've been hanging these up for some time and, uh, uh some, some uh, get taken down, uh, depending on their location. But I think the proximal one we maybe had to put up twice. Um, and uh, the in some places, I think there's something about our signage that just looks so formal and then should you like a part of the development. So people just leave it in, uh, in some cases. I think every side of the uh, project thinks that somebody else and the project did it, like the developer thinks of that and that. Huh? So, um, so they get, they are left there. I think maybe if you go to 2748 um, Jackson Avenue, that you might see some signs. Okay, yeah, just get yeah, sound. Yeah, it, it varies really widely, uh, but you know, people involved in the project uh, have a range of reactions. But uh, I know at least one one site we went to it was actually already partly in construction, uh, and yeah, we had the sign, and the construction crew like thought it was the coolest thing ever, like. They were scanning like construction format was like this is amazing. So, uh, yeah, most mostly positive responses still uh, here and then here and then here. Hi, yeah, I think what you're doing is also super cool. Thanks so much for the presentation. I'm wondering if uh, because one of the goals that you mentioned is uh, empowerment and agency. Sort of what, if anything, you're thinking of integrating into the product that has to do with some engagement, like uh, creating a public comment or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so in our mobile app, we already have, and in our web app, we have the ability to leave comments on projects. Uh, and we're, we're still building out like more robust uh, feedback sort of mechanisms. So right now it's a, okay, you can leave a comment, you can write a project. Um, and that's, a, yeah, it's available in the mobile app and the web app. Uh, but if you're just like doing the AR uh, scan, like you can't like comment directly in that AR view yet. Um, so yeah, things that we're still working out to build more robust and 
you know, anywhere that you see the AR, you can quickly get to the ability to leave feedback. And uh, I just want to add to that, that um, that it's important to have that fe feedback from people and like, while it still matters, like before it's a construction site, right? Like when it's still in planning stages. Um, and uh, one of the things that drives us is, is like to, to do that, to, to enable, to, to get people in the process that people that don't even know that they can be a part of the process or can attend planning hearings. Um, yeah, so that's super important. Thank you for that. Yeah, and sorry, just one word, kind of the theory on that. So like of the you know, thousand, thousand projects we have, like those are permitted projects, right? They're gonna happen. Uh, so important for like community to be able to know about and engage, but like rezoning applications, you know, before the project actually approved, this matters even more. So having, uh, you know, signage and QRs and data availability for rezoning projects is, is really, really important. We're gonna come back to you because uh, two more there and then there. Yeah, just to piggyback on that last question, do you anticipate your technology also, um, you know, would it be used to better visualize, say, the impacts of climate change on the built environment? And uh, it just seemed like a wonderful um, potential. Yeah, I mean, we, we see AR as sort of like the anchor for all sorts of information about a project in this context. So, um, you know, modeling for like flood, flood risk, like now you, don't just have, and, and there's already been examples of like flood AR, like in existing, uh, existing cities, right? But now you could layer on, okay, well, here's, we see the existing buildings. We also see the AR of the future buildings and the AR of like future flooding. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely on our horizon and not just flooding, like all sorts of other climate change related uh, impacts. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, here and then here and then back here. So right, cool. First time I'm using this. So, um, I was also curious about if you model PK or like catastrophe in the buildings or even like how buildings might age over time. Mm. Uh, but I had another question too, just about your research. And so doing background, I'm a PhD student. So of course I'm another very academic question, but, uh, I recently read an interesting article. I think it was in the American Journal of planning history by Andrew Shanker. And he was arguing that like the visual culture of urban planning is kind of an understudied and under theorized thing. And he was looking at how maps in particular, like different techniques of maps or you know, ideas of that, like introduced into the planning profession and then kind of set, you know, the precedent or like what future planning tended to look like. So I wonder, were you looking at that too, to first like thinking about how I had might adopt these technologies and like what are precedents in the past of like under the technologies, even types of maps. Uh, so it might be interesting to consider if that's not something completely fair. Yeah, but I answer your question about the capers. I, I at least have been, but you're talking about like on existing buildings, like projecting what they might look like in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I don't think we thought of that yet, but uh, that's going in the ideas and the backlog now. So I then can you, I, can you like re-summarize your writing question? Just that like when people talk about and study the history of planning, and planning as a perfection, the visual culture of it and like the centrality of visual metaphors and visual technologies like map making is not really considered. Um, but there's a process by which like different ideas kind of diffuse and become mainstream or get adopted by practitioners and then become mainstream in planning and policy. Like redlining couldn't happen without certain kinds of grids existing before that, right? Or like there was a workshop about the census earlier about how that's a certain kind of spatial logic imposed upon geography yeah. that doesn't necessarily align with zip codes or political districts. Yeah. So planning is always responding to that. So I'm thinking like as you're looking in ways to like have this technology more widespread than used, like are there examples in the past of like ways that another kind of technology was adopted? Uh, or another kind of visual technology and planning that was novel at the time gave a different idea of people kind of being able to understand space or think differently about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the person that comes to mind is just like GIS as like a, a whole discipline, but also technology of like layering spatial data uh, in a digital way. So, um, yeah, I guess not meaning of an academic bent for, for our work. We haven't like really thought about that, but, uh, Good, good thing to take away from there. Uh, here? Yeah. I, 
Um, this is really interesting. I, I work for the parks department and, um, so I have kind of from the lens of like, the built environment or the landscape, um, you know, one of the zoning requirements is a tree is planted every 15 feet of frontage per property. Have you thought about incorporating any of the built environment into your models for a future built environment? Yes. Uh, how we're going to do that, uh, at TBD, but definitely on our radar. Uh, I, some of the, I'll, I'll give a little bit more thorough answer that, uh, some of like if for existing, uh, like trees, for example, like there are these like sort of comprehensive layers, uh, for, for digital representations of that. Now, if you're in an AR experience, like you already see the physical tree that's already there, uh, but like projected, um, like required tree planting, uh, or other required changes to the built environment. We have our radar, but we haven't, haven't incorporated yet. Uh, I know you have a question, but I think I saw one over here a while ago. You know, I had a question. I actually was almost specifically on this same point. Uh, I, just, I worked for a landscape designer that actually worked for a lot of parks projects. Um, and it was somewhat challenging to produce renderings uh, of like what parks are going to look like in the future. And partially because you talk about like poly counts, it's really hard to like model a tree to yeah. around. It's two planes with a picture of a tree. It's Michigan way. Base entry and don't really work in bed. Um, so I'm curious if like, if you guys are considering any type of like generative solutions or like how do might, I know you just kind of said you're still working on it, but I'm curious if there's any like um, more intelligent systems than a lot of the render in tech, the tactics being used by now, I kind of like Wednesday. Yeah. I, I think, but like saying we're working on it is like generous We're for like things besides the building versus like, we had it on our radar as like a something to think about, but I don't see DMA if I was saying. I agree. Yeah. It's definitely, well, it's a question that we got a lot. Um, actually working with developers that kind of uh, get intimidated by just like seeing a black uh, or like a gray slab of concrete and are just like, uh, we want to show that there's going to be so much more to it and there's going to be landscape and, and, um, and they, uh, and we've looked into it. It's, it is on our radar and it's hard to do in a real time uh, AR uh, environment. And the other thing I want to mention that's also hard um, is occlusion for trees because right now our content covers the existing trees because there was no way to algorithmically identify a tree and a, and create occlusion so let's say you you go in front of a building the the ar will occlude you um but there's no car occlusion or tree occlusion yet so that's something that the technology is also like you know you're even covering the existing trees so on our radar for both, um, yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you. I think speaking of radar to that point, uh, LIDAR is uh, hopefully going to help with that in the, in the AR scene and the narrative feature, uh, like snap that, that we've partnered with, like they had this sort of like city mesh thing and, uh, others have, have started to experiment with LIDAR within AR. So hopefully in the near future, the tech will catch up. Uh, I think we're over time, right? It's supposed to wrap the three, four. Yeah. What are we good? Oh, okay. Oh, 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 oh. Never mind. Forget that. Uh, right here. Uh, do you have a business model that you can tell us about? I can imagine a few, but I mean, I'm not sure if they are richer thinking of. Yeah. Uh, I'd say in general, uh, one of the, the main entities uh, is that when we talk about supplementing the sort of open data derived layer um, with the developer provided models um, we think that developers are going to want to have that what's what's the sort of estimated models out there they say like well something's out there I want it to be the right thing uh, or the the actual thing um, so uh, we would uh, in charge developers to submit models that way um, you know we're still doing pilot projects uh, and that's that's our, our revenue source right now is uh, working with various clients to just they come one one on one with us to to do a model and then a whole experience around that, um, and then uh, you know we think this is a valuable service for for cities and so we're exploring like is there revenue generation through um, you know selling service to cities and then finally uh, other tech products so like okay for instance like Google Street View like you can go 
backwards in time and see what the street looked like. Um, you know, if our API that in the works, like plug in something like Google Street View, you can go forward in time and see what the city will look like. Um, so if, uh, other tech platforms that would have an interest, a uh, use case for showing the future of cities, um, we're exploring us. Yeah. Thinking of going back in time, are you considering documenting like historical buildings on sites so that people could see what the new building used to look like historically? Uh, yes. Um, uh, you know, being a small startup, we have to like think about like, okay, what, what is like the primary thing we have to build? I think as we like grow and have like more capacity, I think historical buildings as uh, like sort of a, uh, probably good or I don't know, maybe there's like some sort of revenue service there, but like you know, people are using AR for like historical tours, like right now. Uh, and so like that hasn't been like a huge focus for us because like what you're describing is, is already happening to some extent. Um, so. And we're focused on, on solving the, this, um, uh, mapping the future and, and then we can, um, think about that. And I actually work a lot in kind of, uh, before I joined the company, I actually come from working on more historical or archival projects. So it's very much like in my, uh, blood, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that at the moment we're very focused on this mission and we could totally integrate with other, um, promise that focus on that as well. Do you have a sense of how much it would cost for developers to be doing this sort of thing on their own? I think if you weren't putting together these 3D models or if that became a part of the permitting process, how much that would add to the cost of like applying for a permit or doing that sort of pre approval process? So, yeah, uh, um, uh, would be the question, the cost, the estimated cost for developers to do, uh, to provide the 3D models part of the, uh, um, application, the, the permitting, um, it, to my uh, understanding, it would not add much more because there was usually a 3D model um, for the development and we require the the odd little for kind of like the, the shell. And so um, for the architect of the project to create, to adapt, to export something that uh, we can use um, is not, um, not a lot of uh, added budget. To, to for the developer yeah, kind of. so, yeah I, they're almost universally going to have a 3d model yeah. somewhere so for us just when they are sort of like the shell of the building going from that detailed model of the shell like you know we're we're doing that like that for them to do that like a submission of it like that doesn't cost them anything uh for like the validation checks though like that may take uh to get like in places that have that maybe in the u.s someday um, you know, if they have to change their processes of how they do the modeling, then that could add costs. Um, not familiar enough with that world to, to be able to say more about it, but theoretically that kind of application of BIM model submissions could, could add extra cost. But could actually end up saving them costs uh, with, you know, if the validation happens faster, uh, they get the permits faster. So, yeah. Uh, here, and then I just had a question. Um, when you're developing that for the clip code, is it different between iPhone and Android, or is it just kind of the same development and it's kind of handled? I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, so actually, um, AppClip is uh, is an Apple development. The, I'm sorry, I'll repeat the question about uh, whether there's a difference in developing for Android and for iPhone. Um, it It is a difference. You have to develop uh, two apps. We have a native iOS sound at the moment, and app clips are uh, a part of that. So they give you a taste of the app kind of without the, the full download. Um, Android provides the same thing that we are working on. Um, and uh, at the moment, we have the web app solution as well that everybody can access in the browsers and any kind of app or app uh, clip solution. So all of our science, like we'll say for the web app, on Android skin here, but you can stand with iPhone too. Uh, and, and Android kind of has the ability to do something like app clips, uh, where you just get like a bite-sized piece of the app without having to download anything from the app store or the Google Play store. 
we hadn't developed that yet, but they had something comparable. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting ad, um, because I know before the car industry started, I guess I and some other people have felt that the cultural integrity of the community has been literally destroyed by, um, city planning and not providing the type of housing that we need in that community. Um, the nature of the buildings that have been built, uh, as far as many of us are concerned, are out of line in terms of really how the community should be looking. Um, so we have a lot of what I call plain buildings being built uh, basically for money purposes, but not really providing what the community needs. I'm wondering, um, and I don't know, you know, how you all will be pricing this. I hope you're going to make some money from this, uh, if you know, but would community groups be able to use this for free, um, versus, uh, city planning and the developers would have to pay you uh, to use this. I don't know how you're structuring that, but it's just a question I'm telling you. Yeah, sure. So the question to get to the recording, uh, you know, is this kind of service available or will it be available for, for free to community groups? Uh, and yeah, we, we see this as, uh, being available for anyone in the public to be able to access what is being proposed to be built or planned. So, uh, you know, if a developer wants to submit like the actual model, like that would be, you know, they would, they would pay us to be able to do that. But anyone and everyone in community or in a community organization should be able to see what's being planned or proposed, uh, or is, you know, actually permitted to be built. So, uh, short answer is like, yeah, definitely free. Uh, yeah, right here. Yeah. Um, so I've only really like played around with 3D modeling. So this may be sort of a naive question, but. Could you talk a little bit about like the inner mechanics of your like rendering module? Like, is there any particular like existing libraries that it built on top of? Um, and sort of building on that, as a sort of a front runner in this space, are there particular technologies that you see, but both yourselves and like, competitors in this space, you know, centering around like that are slowly becoming the standard? Yeah. So uh, uh, the question is about like uh, pod technical aspects of our rendering 3D AR, right? Kind of all of it, I tend to walk you through that. Um, and um, sort of uh, competitive orders in the space and, and that uh, things that are becoming kind of uh, standard or uh, new treads in the market. Um, okay, so um, we are using um, AirKit and uh, AirCore for our uh, augmented reality uh, geo anchored augmented reality. We use a, a variety of tools because we also work with the uh, stamps AR tools and some of their tools. And in the browser, we use uh, uh, a model viewer that basically allows you to see things in the browser. I think a big thing um, in the industry is um, geo anchored AR is not available in the browser. Um, and there's companies like um, Niantic, uh, the Pokemon Go um, that acquired Inkmall. Inkmall is a browser-based AR um, company, uh, and they're trying to provide good geo-anchored AR in the browser, um, and that is not yet um, uh, scalable because you have to scan sites multiple times to create a mesh for that to be possible. So we would kind of it's a, it's a back and forth uh, with the wing, and and it's a matter of the browser being able to access certain things about the mobile device that are just not um, not open, and that's why the browser experience, which we are all interested in, having things experienced easily in the browser for everybody uh, without having to kind of download your own device. That's a big uh, thing, and there's a lot of developments uh, also in kind of. Um, uh, optimization of, of uh, complex 3D models, be, being able to provide you with a, a good looking rendered 3D model um, uh, that is lightweight and stored in the cloud and just kind of like to pull that dynamically um, into the AR affairs is another thing. Yes, yeah, sorry. 
we have to wrap. Oh, okay. Because I'm straight. So we'll talk to you more about putting your miles duration afterwards here. Uh, you are in the zone. All good. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. And come have some fun. Hey. Hey.